On October 4, 1957, the world was shocked by the Soviet Union's successful launch of the world's first artificial satellite into outer space. Dubbed Sputnik, the beach ball sized object weighed in at 184 pounds and circled Earth every 98 minutes. This singular event marked the dawn of the space age and ushered in the race between the United States and Soviet Union for technological preeminence in space. Less than a month later, the Soviets launched Sputnik 2. This time there was a live payload on board, a stray mongrel dog named Laika. Some worried that the Soviets were now developing the technology to send a man into space next. In response to these developments, less than a year later, on October 1, 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration commenced operations geared toward the peaceful exploration of space. Shortly thereafter, Project Mercury was born with its goal of putting a human in space. By April of 1959, NASA had selected the first seven Mercury astronauts, though none had flown in space as yet. Even as work was ongoing to perfect the techniques and machines needed to carry out the goals of Project Mercury, the Soviets shocked the world again. On April 12, 1961, a Vostok spacecraft was launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. On board was Yuri Gagarin, a 27-year-old major from the Soviet Air Force. Despite being one-upped by the Soviets yet again, work at NASA continued, and on May 5, 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American to fly in space. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. Lift off. All right, there. Lift off, and the clock is starting. That's right. We allow it clear. On May 25, 1961, less than three weeks after Shepard's 15-minute suborbital flight, President John F. Kennedy addressed the joint session of Congress with a bold proposal. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Kennedy upped the ante in a speech he gave on September 12, 1962, before a crowd assembled at Rice University in Houston, Texas. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Project Apollo was conceived to carry out President Kennedy's goal of landing men on the moon and returning them safely to Earth. Between December 1968 and December 1972, 24 men flew to the moon aboard the Apollo spacecraft and of those, 12 walked on the moon. Before Neil Armstrong became the first of those men to step on another celestial body, it was first necessary to master the logistics and techniques needed to carry out that audacious undertaking. On this edition of Manned Space, we chronicle the first four manned flights of the Apollo program and see how those flights truly were the prelude to man's greatest adventure. In May of 1967, 
Alan Shepard gave a speech commemorating the sixth anniversary of his flight aboard Freedom 7 that led to him becoming America's first astronaut. Coming only four months since the Apollo 1 launch pad fire that took the lives of Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, Shepard proclaimed that the time for recrimination is over. Urging the resumption of Project Apollo, Shepard declared there is much work to be done. Let's get on with the job. In reality, the work of Apollo had continued despite the fire, and by mid-May 1967, a crew was named to fly the first manned mission of the program. Selected to command the flight was Wally Shira. Shira had been selected as one of the original seven Mercury astronauts in 1959. He had flown in space aboard Sigma 7 on October 3, 1962, becoming the third American to orbit Earth. Shira returned to space aboard Gemini 6 on December 15, 1965. He was the only astronaut to fly in all three of the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. Joining Shira for the first man flight of the Apollo program was Don Isley. Part of NASA's third group of astronauts, selected in 1963, Isley had originally been chosen to the primary crew of Apollo 1, but after dislocating his shoulder twice during training, he was replaced by Roger Chaffee. Surgery eventually repaired his injury. The final member of the crew was Walt Cunningham. Like Isley, Cunningham was selected to NASA as part of the third group of astronauts. In preparation for their flight, the crew continued training and monitored construction of their Apollo command and service modules. By the summer of 1968, the Apollo 7 spacecraft arrived at Cape Kennedy and was being readied for an October launch. The flight plan called for the crew to spend 11 days in orbit around Earth, a period of time longer than that necessary to complete a round trip to the moon. Other objectives of the mission included a demonstration of the spacecraft's rendezvous capabilities, as well as evaluation of the spacecraft's systems needed to support men and machine during a lunar flight. Countdown for the launch began on October 6, 1968, with a target launch date set for October 11th. On the date appointed for the liftoff, the crew completed breakfast before heading off to be suited up for a launch scheduled for just after 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The weather that morning was hot. There was a stiff breeze blowing in off the Atlantic Ocean. Safety rules dictated that with an east wind prevailing, the launch be scrubbed lest the spacecraft be blown over land in the event an emergency splashdown was necessary. NASA managers decided to waive the rule and allow the launch to go forward. With the death of Apollo 1 commander and next door neighbor Gus Grissom still on his mind, the safety conscious Commander Shira was not pleased with the decision. He would later admit feeling pressure to proceed with the launch. At 11.02 and 35 seconds AM Eastern Daylight Time, the countdown entered its final 10 seconds. Coming up on the 10 second mark. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. We have ignition. Commit liftoff. We have liftoff. This is launch control. We have cleared the tower. Roger, tower clear. The launch was perfect and the crew continued to soar skyward. The next major event to take place would be staging. That is, the shutdown of the Saturn 1B booster the crew was riding, followed by ignition of the S-4B second stage. Coming up on two minutes, Mark, two minutes. Uh, we're having a status check. Apollo 7 has been given a go for staging. Two minutes and 25 seconds after liftoff, the second stage ignited. Three minutes into the launch, Shira reported jettison of the launch escape tower, a system designed to launch an Apollo spacecraft clear of an exploding launch vehicle in the event of a catastrophic failure. Ten and a half minutes after launch, the crew reported shutdown of the second stage engine. Instantly, they went from over two and a half Gs to zero. They had successfully achieved orbit. The next major objective of the Apollo 7 mission was to test the command service module's ability to maneuver while still attached to the spent S-4B stage. Once the crew had successfully demonstrated the spacecraft's ability to perform these maneuvers, it was time to undock from the S-4B in preparation for a planned rendezvous. 
Following separation, the crew fired the command service module's small rockets to place them about 50 feet ahead of the S-4B. They then turned their spacecraft around to simulate rendezvous and docking, maneuvers necessary to extract a lunar module for future lunar flights. Within the first three hours of the mission, Apollo 7 had achieved two major objectives of the flight. The crew then settled in for lunch, enjoying the first hot meal ever eaten by American astronauts in space. At 14 hours 46 minutes ground elapsed time, it was reported that Commander Shira had developed a head cold. By the next day, Cunningham and Isley also experienced head colds. Then, 23 hours and 33 minutes into the flight, Shira delayed without further discussion what was to be the first live television transmission from space by an American crew. Six hours later, Apollo 7 was closing in on the 59-foot S-4B stage it had jettisoned one day earlier. Apollo 7 Houston, uh, how close are you now? We're close to about, uh, oh, about 70 feet. It's tumbling rather wildly, so we're trying to stay away from it. All right, you understand. The rendezvous proved the Apollo spacecraft's ability to maneuver in order to rescue an ailing lunar module during an actual flight to the moon, thus achieving another major objective of the Apollo 7 mission. Then, nearly 50 hours since the original transmission was canceled, the crew of Apollo 7 employed the use of an RCA camera to beam the first television broadcast from space. Hey, we got you. I can see Isley talking there. Hey, Don, turn your head to the right. There you go. The definition is pretty good down here. I can see the center hatch. In a moment of levity and in an homage to the big band radio broadcast of the 1930s, Isley displayed a card that read, From the lovely Apollo room, high atop everything. The crew closed out the first TV transmission by displaying a final card, read in Houston by capsule communicator Tom Stafford. Keep those cards and letters coming in, folks. It's loud and clear. The crew performed daily broadcasts from their spacecraft for the duration of the flight, holding up additional cards and educating viewers about spaceflight. For their efforts, the crew received a special Emmy Award. On eight separate occasions during the course of the 11-day mission, the crew fired the spacecraft's service propulsion system. The big engine located at the rear of the spacecraft necessary to travel to and from the moon. It performed flawlessly. For its part, the command module also performed with near perfection. The cabin remained comfortable during the flight, although coolant lines sweated and water collected on the deck. The crew used the urine dump hose to vacuum the water and purge it from the spacecraft. As for the crew, a packed flight plan, sleep difficulties, and head colds definitely impacted their mood, if not their performance. Commander Shira was still unhappy about the decision to launch, despite marginal wind conditions. As the time for re-entry approached, conflict between the crew and mission controllers in Houston reached a boiling point. With head colds in full bloom, the crew refused to don their helmets as required by mission rules for fear they might sustain permanent injury to their ears. In a rare turn of events, Director of Flight Crew Operations Deke Slayton radioed the crew from Houston in an effort to get them to change their minds. The three men would not be deterred. As they readied for splashdown, they announced they would not wear the helmets and instead agreed to take decongestions one hour before re-entry. Attention then turned to preparations for the re-entry and splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean. Just a final update on the weather and the recovery area. 2,000 broken, winds 270 at 20, wave height is 3 feet. During the 163rd orbit and over Hawaii, the crew fired the service propulsion system for the eighth and final time in order to slow the vehicle for re-entry. The crew splashed down on October 22nd, 200 nautical miles from Bermuda and 7 nautical miles from the recovery vessel USS Essex. The difficulties between the crew and mission control aside, the flight of Apollo 7 was widely considered a success, having achieved most if not all of its objectives. Don Isley would later admit, we were insolent, high-handed, and Machiavellian at times. He concluded, 
it got the job done. No member of the Apollo 7 crew ever returned to space. As October of 1968 drew to a close, James Webb, President Kennedy's choice as NASA Administrator in 1961 and only the second person to hold the job, had retired from the position, but not before making one of the most consequential decisions in the history of America's space program. Deciding that Apollo 8 would be the first crewed mission in history to leave Earth orbit for a journey to the moon. With the success of Apollo 7, NASA's attention next turned to the flight of Apollo 8. As originally conceived, Apollo 8 was to be an unmanned flight, but following the success of the unmanned flight of Apollo 6 and the manned flight of Apollo 7, the decision was made to fly Apollo 8 as a crewed mission. It soon became clear, however, that the lunar module would not be ready to fly within the time frame necessary to meet the launch date of Apollo 8. Additionally, in March of 1968, the Soviet Union launched Zond 4, an uncrewed test of the vehicle designed to carry a crew to the moon. Following the launch pad fire in January 1967 that took the lives of the Apollo 1 crew, NASA Administrator James Webb replaced Apollo Spacecraft Program Office Head Joseph Shea with George Lowe, who had been serving as Deputy Director of the Manned Spacecraft Center. Lowe knew that without a lunar module ready to go, the mission objectives of Apollo 8 had to change. In August of 1968, Lowe proposed to NASA managers that instead of a repeat of an Earth orbital shakedown flight of the Apollo Command Module, the Apollo 8 crew could fly to and orbit the moon during which lunar landing procedures could be tested. NASA Administrator Webb took some convincing. Then, in September 1968, the Soviets launched Zond 5. It was only the second spacecraft to fly to and orbit the moon and return safely to Earth. With the full support of his agency, Webb authorized the lunar flight of Apollo 8. George Lowe's bold proposal to transform Apollo 8 into a lunar mission was instrumental in the United States beating the Soviet Union to the moon. 10, 9, we have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. We have commit. We have, we have lift off. Uh, 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. On the morning of December 21st, 1968, the crew of Apollo 8, Frank Borman, James Lovell, and William Anders, lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center aboard a Saturn V rocket for a rendezvous with the moon. The three men were the first to fly aboard the giant Saturn V launch vehicle, and if all went as planned, they would become the first humans to fly into deep space and orbit another heavenly body. All right, Houston. Now nearly two hours since their launch, the crew of Apollo 8 was ready to leave Earth orbit and head to the moon. Go ahead, Houston. All right, you are go for TLI, over. Roger, understand, we're go for TLI. Apollo 8 coming up on 20 seconds to ignition. Mark it, and you're looking very good. Roger. Ignition. Roger, ignition. Apollo 8 Houston, you're looking good. Apollo 8 Houston, trajectory and guidance look good, over. Roger, Apollo 8, good here. Apollo 8 Houston, you're looking good here, right down the center line. Roger, Apollo 8. Okay, we got Seco right on the money. Roger, understand Seco. At nearly 3 hours and 21 minutes, ground elapsed time, the crew of Apollo 8 separated their command service module from the second stage of the Saturn V launch vehicle and watched as it drifted away. They also observed the Earth getting ever smaller in their window. They were now well on their way to the moon. As the crew of Apollo 8 continued on their outbound passage to the moon, a global audience was unaware that Commander Frank Borman had fallen ill on the spacecraft. Borman had been throwing up and was unable to hold down food. At first, he would not allow his crewmates to report the sickness to mission control. But Lovell and Anders grew increasingly concerned with Borman's condition and convinced Borman to report the news to NASA flight surgeon Dr. Charles Berry. 
Barry was concerned that Borman had caught a bug and would pass it on to his crewmates. He recommended the mission be canceled. When news of the recommendation reached Borman, he was outraged. He reported back to Mission Control that his condition was improving. In fact, it was improving, and soon the illness passed. Borman had likely suffered from a severe case of motion sickness. Then, at approximately 31 hours 20 minutes ground elapsed time, the crew of Apollo 8 took to television, and Borman, now feeling better, described what the crew was seeing. Transmission is coming to you approximately halfway between the moon and the Earth. We've been uh, 31 hours, about 20 minutes into the flight. We have about uh, less than 40 hours left to go to the moon. Show you the Earth. It's a beautiful, beautiful view with uh, predominantly blue background and uh, just huge covers of uh, white clouds. Strictly one very strong vortex up near the Terminator. Very, very beautiful. Then, when Apollo 8 was approximately 200,000 nautical miles from Earth, Jim Lovell described the view. What you're seeing is the Western Hemisphere. Looking at the top is the North Pole. In the center is South America, all the way down to Cape Horn. For colors, waters are all a royal blue. Clouds are uh, bright white. The land areas are generally a brownish to light brown in texture. At 64 hours, 22 minutes, ground elapsed time, the Apollo 8 spacecraft was only 12,761 nautical miles from the moon. The crew was traveling at a velocity of nearly 4,300 feet per second. At that rate, they would reach the moon in about four and a half hours. Up to this point, despite their close proximity to the moon, the crew of Apollo 8 had yet to see it. That would soon change, however. At 69 hours, eight minutes, ground elapsed time, the crew would fire the service propulsion system to slow the spacecraft and enter lunar orbit. But first, at nearly 69 hours ground elapsed time, the crew slipped behind the moon, and while communication with Houston was lost, they became the first humans to see the far side of the moon. 34 minutes after passing on to the far side of the moon, Houston re-established communication with Apollo 8. Aboard the spacecraft, Jim Lovell radio to advise that the lunar orbit insertion burn had been a success. He told mission controllers that the burn was complete and that the spacecraft was now in an elliptical orbit around the moon. The next 12 hours would be taken up photographing both the near and far sides of the moon as well as potential landing sites for future Apollo missions. The crew captured over 870 millimeter still photos. On the crew's fourth orbit around the moon, Bill Anders captured this image. Dubbed Earthrise, it is perhaps the most iconic photograph of the 20th century. At 85 hours, 43 minutes, ground elapsed time on Christmas Eve, during a television transmission from their spacecraft, the crew of Apollo 8 sent greetings from the moon to the people back on Earth. Now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. And divided the waters which were under the firmament, the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. It's estimated that 1 billion people in 64 countries heard or viewed the live message. 
Delayed broadcast reach an additional 30 countries later that same day. The crew then described the moon from 60 miles above its surface. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, uh, what does the old moon look like from 60 miles, over? Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray, no color, looks like plaster of Paris, okay, or uh, sort of a grayish beach sand. We can see quite a bit of detail. Uh, the equator craters are all rounded off. There's quite a few of them. Some of them are newer. Many of them look like, uh, especially the round ones, look like uh, hit by meteorites or projectiles of some sort. After nearly 20 hours since entering lunar orbit and after completing almost 10 orbits around the moon, the crew readied the spacecraft for trans-Earth injection the maneuver that would free them from the moon and set them on a course back home. Apollo 8, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Three minutes, LOS, all systems are go. Over. Roger, thank you, Houston, Apollo 8. All systems are go, Apollo 8. Thank you. And at 88 hours, 51 minutes, we show loss of signal with the spacecraft. Our next communication with Apollo 8 should come in about 37 minutes. Uh, we are now about 28 minutes prior to our trans-Earth injection maneuver. When Apollo 8 re-emerged from the far side of the moon, Jim Lovell radioed Houston with the news that they were now homeward bound. Houston, Apollo 8, over. Hello, Apollo 8. Last clear. Roger. Please be informed there is a Santa Claus. During their trip home, the crew performed two additional television transmissions, bringing to six the total number performed during the mission. On Christmas Day, they enjoyed a surprise from Director of Flight Crew Operations and their boss, Deke Slayton. In the food locker was a real turkey dinner with stuffing, along with three miniature bottles of brandy that Slayton had provided. While the crew enjoyed the dinner, Commander Borman forbade the crew from drinking the brandy lest they lose their edge in preparation for re-entry. 146 hours and 46 minutes after launch, the crew of Apollo 8 re-entered Earth's atmosphere at 400,000 feet, traveling at a velocity of over 36,200 feet per second. The ionization of the spacecraft caused by the re-entry was bright enough to be photographed from a nearby aircraft. The spacecraft's parachutes deployed and the crew splashed down in the Pacific Ocean a mere 2.6 miles from the recovery ship USS Yorktown. The success of the flight of Apollo 8 cleared the way for the lunar landing of Apollo 11 just eight months later. But not before the flights of Apollo 9 and Apollo 10 tested the lunar module in Earth and lunar orbits. As for the crew of Apollo 8, for Frank Borman, Apollo 8 was a second and final space flight. After retiring from NASA and the United States Air Force in 1970, Borman joined Eastern Airlines where he eventually became chairman and CEO, guiding the airline through the four most profitable years of its history. For Bill Anders, Apollo 8 would prove to be his only space flight. Like Borman, Anders also pursued a career in business, ultimately serving as CEO to General Dynamics. Jim Lovell remained at NASA and was named commander of Apollo 13, the ill-fated mission that never made it to the lunar surface. After an explosion aboard Apollo 13's command service module rendered it powerless, the crew took refuge inside their lunar module and eventually returned home safely. Without the lunar module, the crew likely would have perished. The Apollo 13 mission was a reminder of the dangers associated with manned spaceflight. It also helped to underscore just how risky the flight of Apollo 8 was. It was only the second manned flight of the Apollo Command Service Module, and it was the only mission to fly to the moon without a lunar module. Had the events of Apollo 13 taken place aboard Apollo 8, the outcome surely would have been different. For their role in the bold and daring flight of Apollo 8, the crew were named as Time Magazine's Men of the Year for 1968. Even as the crew of Apollo 8 partook in technical debriefings of their mission, preparations were well underway for the flight of Apollo 9. 
Less than a week after splashdown of Apollo 8 on January 3, 1969, the Saturn V launch vehicle that would carry the crew of Apollo 9 on their mission rolled out of the Vehicle Assembly Building. The primary objective of the mission was an Earth orbital engineering test of the first crewed lunar module. In command was James McDivitt. A veteran of the United States Air Force, McDivitt was selected to join NASA as part of the second group of astronauts chosen in 1962. Apollo 9 was McDivitt's second space flight. He had previously commanded Gemini 4 in 1965. Joining McDivitt as command module pilot was David Scott. Scott had flown in space with Neil Armstrong aboard Gemini 8 in March of 1966. The third member of the crew was Lunar Module pilot Russell Rusty Schweiker. Chosen by NASA in 1963 among the third group of astronauts, Apollo 9 was Schweikert's first and only space flight. 10, 9, we have ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engines running, commit. Liftoff. We have liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Roll Plus 17. Pitch program is in. Roll and pitch program are in now to put Apollo 9 on the proper flight, azimuth, and attitude. Now, two minutes since liftoff, Apollo 9 continued skyward. Flight Director Gene Kranz taking a sta staging status check now. Apollo 9 is go for staging. Plus 2 minutes, 15 seconds and go. Inboard's out. Outboard's out. S2 ignition. Thrust is go on the second stage. Downrange 70 miles now. 42 miles high. 9,300 feet per second velocity. Roughly nine minutes later, Apollo 9 entered orbit 103 miles above Earth. For the next 10 days, the crew would use the Apollo command module and lunar module to perform and perfect rendezvous and docking maneuvers necessary to complete a landing on and safe return from the moon. Additionally, if all went as planned, Rusty Schweikert would perform the first extravehicular activity, or EVA, of the Apollo program. He would exit the spacecraft to test the new Lunar EVA spacesuit and portable life support system, or PLIS, future astronauts would wear while walking on the moon. But before the crew could get on with the busy schedule of planned activities, it would first be necessary for the command service module to separate from the third stage of the launch vehicle and retrieve the lunar module still cocooned within its adapter. That job fell to command module pilot David Scott. Approximately two hours and 45 minutes ground elapsed time, he jettisoned the adapter and maneuvered the command service module to get a view of the lunar module. All right, Roger, it's out there, and uh, we're turned around and uh, proceeding uh, with the station keeping and docking. Oh, tremendous, uh, Paul 9. Thank you. Man in service module has separated from the third stage, has turned around, and is now station keeping. During this pass, the command and service modules did separate from the S-4B, the third stage of the launch vehicle. The spacecraft has turned around, and the crew is now inspecting the lunar module which is still inside the spacecraft LAM adapter attached to the S-4B. Then Scott gently coaxed the command service module toward the lunar module in order to dock with the vehicle. Oh, that's just a very hard dock. Uh, Roger, uh, Power 9, understand hard dock. Reported hard dock at 30208. Following the successful joining of the two vehicles, Scott would next back up the command service module and the lunar module would be freed from its protective shell. Apollo 9, this is Houston, you are go for ejection. Roger, go for ejection. Houston, 
Houston, Apollo 9. Uh, go, Apollo 9, this is Houston. Okay, uh, Houston, you're coming in very late, but uh, be advised we had a successful ejection, and uh, we're presently separating very slowly from the S4B. We've got them in sight out all the windows. With the two vehicles now safely docked, most of the major items on the flight plan for the first day of the mission were now complete. Day two of the mission involved more maneuvering of the command service module. Day three, however, would focus more on the lunar module. McDivitt and Schweikert were to perform a checkout of the lunar module. After donning their spacesuits, the pair made their way down a tunnel linking the LEM with the command module. With the mission now including two separate spacecrafts, each was assigned a name to distinguish one from the other. The lunar module would be called Spider, while the command module was referred to as Gumdrop. While all the LEM systems checked out near flawlessly, Schweikert was overcome by nausea and threw up in the vehicle, jeopardizing a planned EVA scheduled for the following day. Nine hours after entering Spider, the pair returned to Gumdrop. Meanwhile, flight controllers in Houston decided to cancel Schweikert's planned two-hour EVA for fear he might throw up in his space helmet. On day four, Schweikert and McDivitt returned to Spider. With his bout with nausea behind him, Schweikert was well enough to perform a modified spacewalk. During the mission's 46th revolution of Earth and while over the United States, Schweikert climbed out of the lunar module for a 37 and a half minute test of the lunar EVA spacesuit and PLIS. With all of the hardware necessary to support life and communications one on his back, Schweikert was a virtual spacecraft unto himself. He reported feeling cool and comfortable during the excursion. While Schweikert was outside the lunar module, Scott opened the hatch of the command module and performed a stand-up EVA during which he observed Schweikert and watched as Earth cruised by below him. As day four drew to a close, the crew looked forward to the following day during which the lunar module and command module would separate and a full-on dress rehearsal of the systems needed for docking and rendezvous would be put to the test. With the push of a button, Dave Scott had freed Spider from Gumdrop and the two vehicles began drifting apart. Once separated, McDivitt and Schweiker tested the lunar module's descent stage engine, that which would be necessary to maneuver for landing on the moon. Four hours later, the descent stage was jettisoned, and for the first time, the ascent engine which would carry astronauts off the lunar surface was fired in space. Both engines performed with near perfection, and soon Spider and Gumdrop would reunite. Good show, Spider. That was a very nice docking. That, that, that wasn't a docking, that was an eye test. Okay, Houston, we're locked up. Well, it sounds like you passed in 2010, uh, Jim. That sounded real beautiful. Good show. Once McDivitt and Schweikert returned to Gumdrop, Spider was jettisoned and its ascent engine ignited until fuel depletion. Other highlights of the mission included two television broadcasts, as well as Earth landmark tracking while over the United States and Southern Atlantic Ocean. After 241 hours and 53 seconds, the crew splashed down 340 miles north of Puerto Rico and within full view of the recovery vessel USS Guadalcanal. Even as the Apollo 9 crew worked in Earth orbit to perfect rendezvous and docking techniques needed to successfully complete a lunar landing and safe return to Earth, the prime and backup crews of Apollo 11 were busy with spaceflight and geology training. Apollo 9 proved the effectiveness of the lunar module and cleared the way for Apollo 10's dress rehearsal of a lunar landing two months later. On March 11, 1969, a giant Saturn V rocket rolled out of the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center. Destined to carry the crew of Apollo 10 on the second manned flight to the moon, 
It first had to complete the four-mile transport to Launch Pad 39B. Apollo 10's planned launch from Pad 39B would mark the first time the pad was used. The commander of Apollo 10 was Thomas Stafford. In 1965, Stafford was aboard Gemini 6 when it rendezvoused with Gemini 7. He returned to space on June 3, 1966 as commander of Gemini 9. The command module pilot was John Young. Young had flown aboard the first flight of the Gemini program and had also commanded Gemini 10. Lunar module pilot Gene Cernan rounded out the crew of space flight veterans. He too had ridden aboard Gemini 9 with Stafford. Now moments from launch, public affairs officer Jack King counted down the last seconds before liftoff of Apollo 10. 10, 9, we have ignition sequence start. Engines on, 5, 4, The mission objective of Apollo 10 was straightforward, if not understated. It was to fly all aspects of a crewed lunar landing except for the landing. Apollo 10 was only the second flight of the lunar module and the second time a crew would leave Earth orbit for a trip to the moon. It would be the first time two crewed vehicles operated around the moon. Cabin pressure is relieving. Downrange one mile, 3.3 nautical miles high. On May 18, 1969, approximately 12 minutes after launch, the crew of Apollo 10 achieved Earth orbit. For the next two and a half hours, mission control is on the ground and the astronauts in the spacecraft continued monitoring the vehicle systems in preparation for translunar injection, or TLI, the maneuver that would put Apollo 10 on a course for the moon. Uh, Roger, 10. Uh, you're go for TLI. Uh, S4B is looking as planned. Engineer says the Saturn is go. In seconds, for only the second time in history, a manned spacecraft would break free from Earth's bonds and head out toward the moon. We're good. Acceleration. Roger. We're burning. Roger, Roger burning. We're on the way. Uh, Roger, we confirm. Seco! Roger, Seco. With the announcement of Seco, Apollo 10 had successfully completed the TLI burn. They were now on their way to the moon. The next critical step in the flight of Apollo 10 was transposition, docking, and ejecting of the lunar module. The maneuver had been successfully performed in Earth orbit by the crew of Apollo 9, but Apollo 10 would mark the first time the maneuver would be done while traveling to the moon. Apparently we can't be more than about 5, 10 feet away. Roger. Our 10 is looking real stable to us. We show you closed and filing. Docked in a second, I hope. Roger. Snap, snap, and we're there. Got two grays. Roger. You saw the docking, Charlie. Get him after alarm. Everything looks snug. Roger. With the live television audience tuned in, the command module the crew named Charlie Brown had successfully captured the lunar module it called Snoopy. As the crew of Apollo 10 continued on its journey to the moon, they took to television once more, this time beaming back pictures of a shrinking Earth and describing what they saw. With this view of the Earth, it uh, looks like the United States, the landmass of the U.S., is showing up better now than it was a few months ago. Right, uh, Bruce, uh, you can really see them. Looks like the New England states are kind of clobbered in there. Right. But uh, the main part of it is coming in real good. Again, you can see the Great American Desert, the Rocky Mountains, and the Sierra Nevada. Soon, the three astronauts settled in for the trip to the moon. As Stafford would later recall, living aboard Apollo, especially with the lunar module, was far easier than living on Gemini. By the end of the first day, the crew of Apollo 10 was nearly 23,000 miles from Earth and advancing rapidly toward the moon. 
Day two of the mission would see Lunar Module pilot Gene Cernan enter the Lunar Module Snoopy. In his book, We Have Capture, Stafford recalls seeing Cernan return from Snoopy covered with white flecks of insulation. According to Stafford, a Mylar cover attached to a hatch door had torn, releasing a cloud of white fiberglass. He later worried that the crew was forced to breathe it in. Shortly before the second day of the mission concluded, the crew of Apollo 10 was over 135,000 nautical miles from Earth, traveling toward the moon at over 4,400 feet per second. The crew spent much of day three preparing for the next major event on the flight plan, lunar orbit insertion scheduled to occur at 76 hours ground elapsed time. A mid-course correction burn scheduled for this day was canceled. Apollo 10's trajectory was so accurate the burn was deemed unnecessary. The crew was 150,000 miles from Earth, a mere 1.15 miles off course. Day 4 began with Apollo 10 mere hours from the moon. Soon it would pass behind the moon's western rim and if all went as planned, re-emerge in lunar orbit. Apollo 10, Houston, uh, two minutes to LOS. Uh, everybody here says got to see. Okay, and we'll see you right on the other side in orbit. While the crew was on the far side of the moon, the spacecraft's engine fired to slow the vehicle and the crew entered lunar orbit. Hello, Apollo 10, Houston, over. Uh, Roger, Houston, Apollo 10, you can tell the world that we have arrived. Roger. With the crew safely in orbit, the three astronauts did another television transmission describing for people back home the view of the moon. We caught a couple of real pretty little volcanoes, there's no doubt about them, and it still looks kind of brownish gray to us here. There was one volcano, or whatever it was, that it was all white on the outside, but definitely black around the top of it. Charlie, it might sound corny, but the view is really out of this world. Before bedding down for another rest period, Cernan would make a final check of Snoopy to be sure it was ready for its big show the following day. Following breakfast on May 22nd, Cernan and Stafford entered the lunar module during the 12th revolution of the moon a little more than 98 hours into the flight. Soon, Charlie Brown and Snoopy would undock, and with John Young still in the command module, Cernan and Stafford would take the lunar module down toward the lunar surface. This is Apollo Control at 100 hours, 23 minutes, 2 minutes, 23 seconds away from acquiring Snoopy. Oh, Houston, Houston, this is Snoopy. Right, Snoop, go ahead. It's going, we is down among us, Charlie. Roger, I hear you weaving your way up the freeway. As Snoopy raced across the lunar landscape, it reached its closest point to the moon near the Sea of Tranquility, the future landing site of Apollo 11. Knowing that Neil Armstrong might soon fly an approach to the Sea of Tranquility, Stafford described the landing site in as much detail as he could. He reported the site appeared more smooth than first thought. Stafford and Cernan looped around the moon once more, taking Snoopy to its highest altitude before again swooping down over the Sea of Tranquility where the pair would jettison the vehicle's descent stage and fire the ascent engine to simulate a launch from the lunar surface, a skill necessary to complete a lunar landing mission. As the two prepared for the maneuver, Cernan flipped a switch activating one of Snoopy's two radar systems. Moments later, Stafford threw the same switch unaware Cernan had already done so, thereby deactivating the system. The mistake became immediately evident when the descent stage was jettisoned. As Cernan later described, Snoopy was suddenly bouncing, diving, and spinning all over the place. Cernan recounted seeing the lunar surface corkscrewed through the window. The vehicle was totally out of control. The spacecraft's radar, which should have been seeking out Charlie Brown, was instead locked on the moon. Fifteen seconds after the event began, Stafford took over manual operation of Snoopy and regained control. A later analysis of the data related to the incident indicated Stafford and Cernan were two seconds from crashing onto the lunar surface. With the work of flying Snoopy complete, and with the vehicle back under control, it was time for the two men to reunite with Charlie Brown. Hey Joe, uh, we're about ready to dock. Good John, you're into about five feet, babe. Looking beautiful. 
12 hours since entering Snoopy, Stafford and Cernan were now back inside Charlie Brown. As the crew dipped behind the moon, Snoopy was jettisoned into an orbit around the sun. Following a well-deserved nine-hour sleep period, the crew would continue orbiting the moon, photographing potential landing sites. Then, 137 hours since launching from the Kennedy Space Center, and 60 hours since arriving in lunar orbit, John Young fired the service propulsion system, setting the crew on a course back to Earth. Hello, Houston, Apollo 10. Hello, Apollo 10, this is Houston. How'd the burn go? Uh, Roger, Houston, we are returning to the Earth. Over. Glad to have you on the way back home, 10. On the way back home, the crew of Apollo 10 took part in another American space first, becoming the first crew to successfully shave in space. Concerns about astronauts cutting themselves in zero-G and whiskers floating in the cabin had deprived previous crews of this luxury. Now three hours before re-entry, a final burn of the spacecraft's engine was performed to give the crew the perfect re-entry angle. This is Apollo Control, Apollo 10 just crossing the West Australian coast in a long track toward the splashdown point uh, 350 nautical miles east of Pango Pango, American Samoa. 192 hours, 3 minutes and 23 seconds since liftoff, the crew of Apollo 10 splashed down in the Pacific Ocean with sight of the prime recovery vessel USS Princeton. During the crew's eight-day mission, they traveled nearly 831,000 miles. They completed 31 revolutions around the moon and achieved the highest speed ever flown by a crewed vehicle up to that time. Like the three Apollo missions before it, Apollo 10 met most if not all of its mission objectives and cleared the way for the flight of Apollo 11, scheduled to launch in just two months. We are go for Apollo 11. Please be sure to watch out for our upcoming video on the flight of Apollo 11. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe in order to see more great content about manned space.